All right, ladies, welcome back to the podcast and happy new year. It is 2022 at the time of this recording, January 5th. (laughs) I almost didn't know that. (laughs) January 5th, we're into a new year. The last two years have been so tough on everybody. I am really crossing my fingers that 2022 is going to be on the upswing out of this COVID stuff out into the world again. And so I wanted to do right off the bat in the new year, a round table discussion with some of my favorite people in the industry. These two women have been instrumental in my own business last year, in my own life. We've been helping each other. We've been being trained by each other, coached by each other. It's just been amazing. So I asked these two women to please come on the show with me and do my first roundtable talk of 2022. And we are going to be talking all things weight loss, hormones, and fitness. With me today is the lovely Pam Sherman and Dana Lawson. Pam has been a coach for 24 plus years. She has also, this is her second appearance on the show. So you can go back and listen to my podcast that I did with her earlier in the year. I'll link to it in the show notes. Starting as a group exercise instructor and personal trainer after struggling with her own weight, Pam started strength training in 2014 and has never looked back. Dana is a menopause coach. And besides myself, she is one of my favorite menopause coaches. (laughs) Can I say that about myself? (laughs) Sure. She's on a mission to help you get off the emotional roller coaster, balance your hormones and connect with your body in a way that you have not experienced before. Her programs provide the tools, resources, and support you need to become symptom-free. So ladies, welcome to my first roundtable talk. I've been so excited to come for how, when we first started talking about it, I'm like, oh, it's finally the day. (laughs) Super excited. Thank you so much. You guys, I love you both. You know that. Um, I met Pam earlier this year, but I've met Dana actually a couple years ago when she reached out to me. And it's kind of, I have to tell the story, Dana, because this was so funny. So she joined the on track membership a couple years ago. And we had a private session together. She had done some hormone testing. So we went through her hormone testing together and I got her all set up and she ha- she's going to tell you the experience she had with it, exactly her transformation. But here's the funny part is it was like months into her being in on track and she emails me this email, very serious <laughs> going, Karen, I have to talk to you. Can we please set up an appointment? I have something that I need to tell you. And I'm like, I oh, did. Oh I did. my gosh, what's going to happen? <laughs> like, what is she going to tell me? And I'm thinking, is there something really wrong? What's going on? Like, she was so serious. And she says, Karen, I'm a health coach. <laughs> like oh my gosh that's amazing why are you worried about that she was just worried like she's in my group and she's like she didn't want to say like I'm a health coach but here she was an amazing health coach at that she was there to learn because she has a passion about hormones she was going through stuff herself and this just set her on her own trajectory which has been I think amazing how far you've come in the last couple years so Dina just tell your side of the story we've heard Pam's and so you know, you guys can go back and listen to my interview with Pam. She's got an incredible story as well. Yes, Pam's story is incredible. It is incredible. Pam Mm -hmm. had a horrible car accident that she rebounded from. And anyways, you can go back and listen to that. Dana, tell us your story. Well, yes. uh, Thanks for throwing that out there, Pam. Because I remember that distinctly. Um, I was so nervous because I thought, oh, she's going to kick me out of this group. But um, so my journey um, happened, it started back uh, when I was about 45. I mean, now that I understand what's going on, I, I can look back and say it was about 45 when I started to and how old are you now? I am, I'll be 54, 55. Wait, how old am I? <laughs> I'll be 55 next year. <laughs> okay. Pam, how old are you? 54, 55 in April. Oh, so same age, you guys. Okay. And I am going to be 46 in April. You two could pass for 40s. I just want you to, everybody go look at the video of this. These two women are so beautiful. They're just the epitome of let's age gorgeous. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Dana, keep going. Keep (laughs) going. That's okay. okay. So I started experiencing these symptoms 
the ones that hit me the hardest were the night sweats, hot flashes, depression. Um, I'm usually a very upbeat, happy, energetic person. And it was like the life had been sucked out of me. And I didn't know who I was and I didn't feel comfortable in my skin. And I just started looking for answers. And um, I'm a health coach. So naturally I would start to do some of the things that I knew to do to make myself feel better, but they weren't working. And I was like, oh no, what do I do now? So I actually reached out to a cohort that I went to school with and said, hey, can you kind of, can you coach me a little bit? Maybe I just need a little, you know, just to get back on track. Funny, I should say that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so she um, looked at my lab work and she said, um, I think you're in menopause. And I was like, what, what is that? And so she actually turned me on to you and I listened to a podcast. That's when I ordered the other kit. You did the testing. And I was like, this is where I need to be in order to get my life back in order and to feel amazing. And tell us about, because Dana, you guys, she was trying every diet under the sun, like oh, we all yeah. do. She ha was eating very well. She was taking the supplement. She was doing what she was being, you know, what everybody is telling her to do as far as trying to lose weight. And so what made that, what shifted it for you that was different when we were together? It was absolutely the hormones. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I failed to mention, I had gained 30 pounds in a very, very oh, short amount of time. And it was so discouraging. And I tried not to focus on it and, you know, just to be, um, to be happy and positive uh, about other things. But it, that was always playing in the back of my mind and I didn't really feel good about myself. So um, it was definitely the hormones. And I also learned a little bit later, you know, after working with you, adrenals and thyroid, that was a problem. Uh, but once I started to, and even though I thought I was eating well, there were still things in my diet that I wasn't aware of that were, that was giving me inflammatory responses. And so I needed to further like dig in and see, you know, what, what does my body really want? What does it need? It was like, I think I mentioned this to you before. It's like, all of a sudden my body started speaking Japanese. Yeah. And I was like, sorry, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. <laughs> and I had to learn this new menopause language. And, and how it was affecting my body and what I needed to do to put it all back into order. Wow. And she's lost 30 pounds, which is like amazing. <laughs> you can go onto my website actually. And I have a before and after picture from Dana on my website, on the on track page. So check, check her out. I, you were gorgeous before like and after. But... <laughs> that was like 12 or 15 pounds in. Yeah. Wow. That picture. Yeah. Wow. So it was amazing. And Pam, you don't come from like a naturally thin background either. Do you? Don't. I was uh, in college. I was the overachiever and gained the freshman 30, not the freshman 15. <laughs> and that was back in the eighties when the big baggy clothing was in style. Yes. So it was easy to hide. I remember going home to my parents' house and, you know, getting on the scale and going like, no way. Cause I never looked at myself. I was in the dorms, you know, you don't have a really full length mirrors in the dorms. And I, I stayed actually very heavy despite being a marathon runner because I ate like crap. We didn't know anything about nutrition back in the day. There was no internet, no anything, lots of fast food. And I was the healthy eater of my friends. And then it seems like I was always battling an extra 10 pounds or so. And then in 2014, my dad had lived close to me and was around me for three years declining with Alzheimer's and I'm sure the emotional I wasn't you know I don't not a big drinker not a big sugar eater but too many calories even healthy food is too many calories and I put on 20 True. extra pounds yeah um, yeah and and it was that was my this is it I'm not doing this again gotta get it off so yeah for people that think oh because you're a group exercise instructor or trainer you have it easy that that's absolutely not the case. No. And all three of us have thyroid problems, have hypothyroidism and have struggled with that for a long time, which makes weight loss really hard. So the advice you're getting today, listeners, 
<laughs> is tr tried and true that we've done, we've gone through these things ourselves. This is what's worked for us. And this is what's going to, what has worked for our clients. So we really wanted to get into new year's resolutions. We, we don't like the new year's resolutions. And so we <laughs> want to talk about what people can do instead of, you know, proclaiming these big, you know, I'm going to lose 20 pounds. I'm going to go on this diet. I'm going to go on this exercise regime. <laughs> so what can we do instead? And let's maybe just start with your guys's experience. Pam, what's your experience with new year's resolutions? I have never had a client successfully keep any resolution <laughs> there because we go. It's, it's, I'm going to stop drinking wine, do an hour of cardio a day, stop eating carbs. I'm like, oh my God, that's going to last not even a whole day. Yeah. <laughs> and when I say like, let's take baby steps and make small changes, like, well, that's not exciting. It's not glamorous. It's not instant. You know, in our, in society, it's not instant. I'm like, yeah, but you're not going to keep these five huge resolutions that you have. So I don't like new year, new you. I like the old you. Let's just change your habits to get to the place where you want to be. Yeah. 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 I find too, like when we make new year's resolutions and if it has to do about dieting or losing weight, we immediately have an end to that thought, right? So mm -hmm. we're saying, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to do this diet and I'm going to lose 20 pounds this, you know, in the next six months. I'm going to, like you said, do an hour of cardio a day. I'm going to change my diet. I'm going to go low carb. I'm going to when we think like that, we automatically have an end to it. it. Meaning like you go on the diet and you think I'm going to lose the 20 pounds and you're, and subconsciously we think then that's, it. that's the end of that. Then we can go back to eating our healthy, you know, our unhealthy ways and maintain this 20 pound weight loss. And it's subconscious. We don't really go t t farther than I'm going to lose this 20 pounds by doing this diet. But people don't go past that. And I think that that's where we go wrong. We have to, like Pam said, we've got to make these really small little habit changes that we think about as being lifestyle shifts that are going to be with us forever, not just for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. What can we do that's going to move us towards our goals that are these small shifts that we can maintain forever? Yeah, I agree. Go ahead, Pam. I, I was just on the, I did a segment on my local Fox 40 show and my, one of my talking points was don't do, don't diet. And the host was like, don't diet. I said, any diet that has a name, you are going to go off of it eventually. And just like you said, Karen, it has to be something that you can do forever. So every diet works. I'm going to say that right now. Every single diet works Yes. Yeah. until it doesn't because you're done. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> in, in 2005, my in-laws did Weight Watchers. My father-in-law lost a hundred pounds. Wow. wow. We don't know how much my mother-in-law lost because she wouldn't tell us. Uh, but, but, and they felt great. They took pictures and then they stopped and he ended up gaining it all back and ended up dying from obesity related illness. Um, and I've, I just asked her actually at Thanksgiving, like, why did you stop? And she's like, I don't know. We just, we just stopped. And, it, and they, they were walking a mile a day. They were counting their points. They, I mean, they were feeling great, but it wasn't what, who they were. And they mm -hmm. didn't, you know, it was just- Not sustainable. No, mm -hmm. because they got to the finish line, Karen. Exactly. And Dana, they got to the finish line. Exactly. And that's where yeah. we all go wrong, right? Yeah. yeah. And it just yeah, doesn't- I've never been into to, um, New Year's resolutions myself. Um, I, I know they don't work. <laughs> And they absolutely do not work. And I think like, just like Pam was saying, once you cross the finish line, it's like, okay, so now what do I do? Okay. I guess I'll go back to what I was doing before. Yeah. <laughs> and people don't really think of it as a whole lifestyle change and, you know, even, even setting other goals. Yeah. Yeah. And I think something that I've learned, we can talk about this, um, is kind of like what our favorite weight loss tactics are, our favorite diet, whatever. But I've learned it every year. I seem to learn more and more, of course, right? I'm sure you guys do as well. We're because we're in this industry, we're constantly learning new things and new research papers are coming out. And and I, I really feel like weight loss is so much more than what we're being told it is. And I know that most people kind of think that, but they still are going and trying to look for that next best diet. And we really have to shift how we look at weight loss and how to lose weight. Now, 
one thing that we want to really talk about here today when it comes to that is the whole calories in, calories out model and how we've seen this work in our own practice because we actually have quite different views on this. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> I want to talk about this. <laughs> And Karen, I know you have some really strong opinions about that. So can you tell us what your view is? What do you think about it? So I have never liked calorie counting. I, it drives me nuts because it just doesn't work for the long term. So you go and you find these calculators online. That's like, you know, you get into your MyFitnessPal and it says, what are your goals? Okay, I want to lose 15 pounds by in the next six months. And you put in all your information, then it spits out these numbers at you. So I think mine was, I, there's, I, I tried several different calculators and I got different answers on all of them. It went from 1200 all the way up to 2000 calories a day was what I was oh, going to wow. need to eat in order to lose weight. And if I continued this way, you know, when you type in these things, it'd be like, oh, you, you know, I ate 1200 calories a day today. And then the, the thing, the app says, you continue like this, you're going to lose 10 pounds by January 30th. And I'm like, screw you, my fitness pal. I am not going to be losing weight like that because it just doesn't work. And I'm like, for me, that model doesn't work for me. I can count, ca cut calories. My body is like, doesn't move. It says I can go up to 2000 calories. I can go down to 800 calories. I don't lose weight. <laughs> so I just feel like it's such a broken model. However, so I've been coached by Pam this past year and Pam said, Karen, I'm going to have you do my, my fitness pal. And I want to see what you're eating every day, and what you're doing. And so I'm like, screw you, Pam, damn, damn you, right. Pam. Hold me to the fire. <laughs> Cause Pam is, is very much a calorie counter and she's going to tell us why she thinks that this is a good thing. Anyways, I started doing what I, what my coach was telling me to do. She was training me and getting my muscles built up and get me to eat more protein, which is all amazing. And I have to say it was a, it was good for me to do it for a while because I really wanted to see how much I was eating on average. I found that there was a lot of the time, I, I think I under ate considering how much more mm -hmm. I was training because mm -hmm. thanks to Pam, right. I'd really upped my weightlifting yeah. and my workouts were now anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes a day, five days a week. And she was getting me to do more cardio. And so there was days where I was like, Ooh, I don't think that's enough. Or my protein intake was just shit. Wasn't it Pam? <laughs> yes. Yes, it was. Wow. And so it was this amazing experience. And Pam, I haven't told you this yet because I was saving it to talk, talk about on this podcast. The other day I decided, so in my fitness pal, when I'm writing to, for Pam, what I ate in a day, I was always putting that I had two tablespoons of heavy whipping cream in like heavy cream in my coffee in the morning, right? Two tablespoons, not a big deal. I thought, right. Pam was jealous that I was able to drink the whipping cream <laughs> in my coffee because she can't. Sure. So the other day I thought I'm going to measure how much cream I actually am drinking in my coffee because with my husband home over the holidays, we would drink more coffee. We'd have a couple cups in the morning. I was averaging, I'm so embarrassed to say 300 calories of cream first thing in the morning, 300 calories. So Pam, that's delicious. <laughs> so delicious i've Truth been cutting down now to two tablespoons and i'm like this is weak i need like half a cup in here so there was a good reason why people should do it at least for a period of time but yeah. pam what's been your experience with it and how has it helped you and your clients well to help you out what i do in my coffee is i use cashew milk and or almond milk and low calorie milk and then use your heavy whipping cream because we all like our coffee a certain color yes mm -hmm. and the lower calorie yeah. nut milks can help you get your color without drinking 300 calories okay good good that's a great tip thank I you i started using the nut pods pam it's <laughs> delicious. delicious what are the nut pods it's a non-dairy creamer that's oh. five or 10 calories of deliciousness. So we, I could literally drink the whole thing for 250 calories. I don't, but I could. Wow. It is really good. 
It's delicious. They have sweetened, that is uh, five calories for a tablespoon and unsweetened is 10 calories for a tablespoon. Amazing. Okay. I'm going to check those out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're, it, and like I said, I use cashew milk too, because I, coffee is a food group for me. I love it, Me too. but I like it. A, like, I would have that much myself in creamer because I like it a certain color, but the milk helps me get there while not dr- drinking 300 calories. <laughs> yeah. And the reason Bio I love hack. my, yeah. <laughs> and the reason I love my fitness pal is just for that reason, Karen, is because most women are like this have no clue. They're like, just looking straight ahead, what they're eating, how much they're eating, how much protein they're not eating, which is the key to staying full. It's the key to helping us preserve our muscles because we lose muscle every decade after the age of 30. Yeah. And that's why you see so many people in their, you know, elderly people with sarcopenia barely, you know, leaning over bad muscle. I mean, we want to preserve our muscle and we're not going to do that unless we eat enough protein and women are chronic under eaters and strength train. So I love that both you and Dana are strength training because that is really the, it's the fountain of youth. I am convinced of it. Same. Yeah. Um, but what I all my, say so. yeah, all my, all my clients that I have, I do food coaching. We are my friends on my fitness pal and I can look at it and be like, you know what? You only had like a piece of toast or, you know, you only had one egg. One egg is not enough protein. You need 25 to 30 grams per meal. And women are like, what? Like, you know what? You can have an egg and a cup of egg whites. So you can have a protein shake because Karen, I know you had a hard time getting it. So you got a protein shake that you like that's super clean, that has enough protein. And that's really going to help everybody stay full for longer, as well as so many women eat so many empty calories. I'm like, you're eating empty calories because you're not getting enough protein at your meals. So by seeing what they're eating, you can get so much more bang for your buck. If you focus your meals around protein and fiber and by me looking at that with my clients, I go, you know, you can eat a lot of, you can eat a lot of food for 1400 calories. If you're eating protein and veg with a little bit of healthy fats, it's the problem of, we all love our comfort food and it's carbs because we're women of oh, duh, everybody does, Yeah. but let's fill up on the good stuff first. But I find it's really eye opening for women when we have that sit down conversation on, you know what, you can have 1600 calories like that if you're eating a lot of processed crappy foods. But if you stick with real food, focus around protein and veg, you can get a lot and you can be really full and weight loss doesn't have to be so like, like you're white knuckling it every single day. (laughs) Exactly. And I think when it comes to like, what diet is best, like you said, Pam, every diet works. We know this, every single diet works that's out there. There's been proven vegan can work for weight loss. Freaking the grade free diet can work for weight loss. <laughs> cabbage soup diet. <laughs> cabbage soup right. diet. There's so many different things out there and you can find evidence to support that they work. Now, one of the reasons, and I know you're really big on this too, Dana, is anti-inflammatory diets. And that can include things like a paleo-based diet, autoimmune paleo diet, the whole 30, things like that. It's not to say like, this is going to make you lose more weight than the vegan diet. But what I have found and why I always lean towards primal-based diets is that it does exactly what you're talking about, Pam, which is it creates a natural caloric deficit a lot of the time, because if you're eating a bunch of carbs, your blood sugar goes up and then it crashes. And then you're chasing that all day long because you don't feel good. So if you're eating a lot of high amounts of carbs with no protein, you're going on this swing, this roller coaster of blood sugar all day long, which makes you eat more. But if there's protein involved, that swing doesn't happen so hard. And it's very, very hard to overeat animal protein. Very easy to overeat pasta. (laughs) Period. Why? Yeah. (laughs) Dana, I was curious, what foods did you find that were inflammatory for you when you were on your weight loss Mm -hmm. journey? Um, One thing I found was corn. And I wasn't a huge corn eater, but I did like cornbread and um, I liked popcorn. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I love popcorn. So that's inflammatory. If I have too many eggs, I love eggs. But if I overdo it on the eggs, I will feel it in my joints big time. Yeah, same. So those those two things. um, And when I remove gluten, 
uh, completely, that also made a big difference um, in how I felt, how my body felt. Mm -hmm. So that was very insightful because all of, like all along, I thought I was eating well, but I still had things in my diet that my body was like, nope, you need to take that out. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's so good to know that though. And it you've is. had really good experience as well with anti-inflammatory diets, haven't you? With your clients? Yes. Yes, I have. It's amazing to see their transformation because like me, many of my clients feel like, well, I eat really good. I don't understand what's going on. And, and it's amazing to see once they make that shift to do um, the anti-inflammatory or a paleo diet. And first of all, they lose the inflammation, uh, inflammatory weight. So that's a, you know, low hanging fruit. We all want that, but then they feel, they feel better. Many of them tell me they don't have the aches and pains. They don't feel the brain fog and the, and the slowness, the mental slowness, and they have more energy. Everybody wants to have more energy. So it's been really, really um, eye-opening and insightful for myself and my clients as well. Mm -hmm. awesome. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. so we talked about calories. Uh, you did, Karen. Um, but what about um, as counting of steps? Okay. Cause, wow. cause I, you know, I did that. I do that kind of still. <laughs> so, and I know people who do, they swear by it. So what's the deal with counting steps? Can you clear this up, please, Pam? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Set the record straight. <laughs> Karen, I, I forget. Are we allowed to swear? Um, it, not the F word. Okay. <laughs> That's where I draw I the would, line. I, I would never, I would never anyway. <laughs> okay. Okay. What I say is our bodies are meant to move every day for the rest of our lives. And walking is excellent for, it's called neat non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So it's daily calorie burn. Our bodies burn the most calories every day, just living. Our organs need calories to function. Most of us burn between 12 to 1600 calories a day, just living. When somebody's trying to lose weight, I do not give a shit how many steps they, they walk. That's never going to make a difference in their weight loss. Wow. It is always going to be about what they eat. Do I want mm. them to move? 100%. They should be moving. We are meant to move. We are not meant to sit all the time. But as far as like, I got my 15,000 steps. What did you eat? Did you get enough protein? Did you have vegetables? Do you, how much fiber did you have today? It really does not make a difference in the weight loss equation. Should we be doing it? 1000% yes. All those little things that you hear on like parking far away from the door, taking your dog for a walk. If you're sitting at a desk, getting up every hour to take a five minute walk around your house or around the block. Yes, yes, yes. But it's, the, you know, with everybody has their fitness tracker and every day I walk this much. I'm like, it, it literally does not matter. And I did have a good friend text me, Pam, I'm doing 10,000 steps a day and she wants to lose weight. And I told her the same thing. Like, great. Her name is Rachel. I don't give a shit about your steps. What did you eat today? And she goes, I don't want to tell you. And I'm like, okay. All righty. And she's yes. a friend. So, I mean, I yeah. don't talk about, I mean, I don't talk about my clients. It was a friend, but really, it really is so much more important. Nutrition, in my opinion, is the driver about 90% as far as weight loss. A workout might burn a hundred, maybe 200 calories. Don't ever believe the numbers at your gyms, whatever the cardio machine says you burn. They're not right. Cut it in half. But people tend to think, oh, I burned 300 calories on the treadmills. Now I can eat that back. No, 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 no. So exercise. Um, yes, we should be walking. Please do more, but it's never going to be a huge factor in your weight loss. It's really always going to be in my, in my experience, in my opinion, about creating that calorie deficit by eating nutrient dense food, mostly food going from the ground, very paleo like. Although I have found for women, they need to be lower fat. The higher fat has never worked for any woman that I've ever worked with. Oh, interesting. Mm, I, that I, is interesting. I agree with that. And that's something that's kind of new, kind of coming out right now, which is easy does it on the fat because we just went through this crate. We went from very low fat diets to way too much in the ketogenic. Yep. craze. And mm -hmm. then now it's starting to shift back going, Oh, wait a sec. People are drinking 300 calories of whipping cream in the morning. This <laughs> maybe it's not such a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting. I found when I had my, I, I bought my first uh, tracking device a couple months ago and was excited. And I thought, Oh, well, maybe this will just help me just move more. And mm -hmm. it, I found it stressed me out. I sent it back because I was like, <laughs> 
frick i've only done like a thousand steps today Shoot, yeah. i can't show pam this you know <laughs> karen i have been listening to i want to say darn near all of your podcasts you've had some unbelievable guests on so many of them have amazing information how can you possibly take a little bit from everybody and think this is right for me what if what have you gleaned the most from your guests Oh, geez. You know what? I That's think a good question. it is. I mean, I, every single guest teaches me something like the last guest I just interviewed this morning, she taught me a lot about heart rate variability that I had no idea about. And she uses lots of trackable stuff. And so she really, she made a good point to why you would want to wear these things, right? The trackables and what, how that can help you optimize your health. And so that really taught me something, but I would say, Yes, everyone teaches me a little something. I think some of the most powerful interviews I've done have been the, the least listened to. Isn't that sad? This yes. is, and you know wow. why? The, the ones that I found to be so powerful and so like, maybe because it's, this is, it just resonates with me are the people that talk about emotional stuff, the psychology of things, you know, getting to the bottom of past traumas. I had a woman, Annie, um, Annie Hopper, who's, uh, she does this very unique type of brain training. And she talks a lot about traumas, like even just little traumas, chemical traumas, like she herself was exposed to these really harsh chemicals. And her whole system shut down. It was crazy. Like her, she just, like, she couldn't handle anything. She couldn't handle smells. She had to go live in a boat by herself because oh. she couldn't handle anything. And so her, and then she just dove into the research of how do we change our brain pattern? She was stuck in fight or flight. And I just resonate with stuff like that because when it comes to our health and when it comes to weight loss, you know, which is what's always forefront for so many women nowadays, you know, it's like, yes, we've got all these health problems, but number one is we want to lose weight and across the board. Always, every woman always. is like, yep. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll lick the dirt off that floor. If you tell me it's going to make me lose 10 pounds, right? Like we just want to hear what's going to work for us. What's going to help us to lose the weight. And I think a big, huge missing piece in that puzzle is dealing with past stuff, is dealing with trauma, dealing with limiting beliefs that we have inside ourselves. And, you know, our, we put our, gl our glass ceiling is so low. You know, women don't think they can go past that. It's like their goals and they're, they, they just up to here. And it's like, no, we, can, we have so much potential, but because of our history and our past and what our parents taught us and what society taught us and how we were raised, it makes us have so many limiting beliefs about ourselves and to be able to look past that, change your perception of things, change those limiting beliefs, believe in yourself, I think is massive. And so I think that that's where, what I've learned probably the most is being so effective in our healing journey is that mind body connection, dealing with past crap. Um, it's, we have to, we have to. Yeah. You can't ignore it. You cannot ignore it. I've had some really great experiences with some of my clients who have, um, you know, just kind of dug in, in some of their past um, experiences and even just, you know, the things that affect them on a day to day, they weren't always relating what they experience every day with something that happened in the past. So, and you know, all of us know women are really, really hard on themselves they, they, they overdo everything and they want to be there for everybody. Yeah. And um, my clients, two of them in particular that I know of, had a, I had them do an exercise on breaking the rules and being bad, which is not, you know, anything illegal, but just... <laughs> just go out and sell some cocaine on the street. Right. That's right. your homework for today. <laughs> That's your homework. <laughs> but it was just kind of lighten up and do something, do some things that were breaking the rules, but not illegal, um, you know, and having some fun with it. And, and give us an example. In the beginning. So one example I gave um, was to make a prank phone call, like call somebody and make a prank phone call. And they all looked at me like, 
I, what, do you really want me to do that? <laughs> uh, your number shows up now. It's not like in the seventies when you didn't know who was calling. How did that work? So they called people they knew, but just okay. pretended to be someone else. Okay. <laughs> and then when it was safe to be in the stores, even masked, um, you know, people are always talking about what's going on and in having conversations. And so I told them, just pretend to be somebody else, fake an accent, like be British <laughs> and like stay in that character. Don't break character. They all like their mouth dropped open. But when they did those things, they felt so free. And it was like, that was so much fun. I don't know why I never did that before. <laughs> like cut the tag off of your mattress that says, you know, this tag shouldn't be removed. Cut it off. I mean, what's going to happen? <laughs> Nothing. I love it. <laughs> and, and it really, really brought out some where they felt very restricted and, you know, like by the book, everything, um, it really helped them to open up more. And then it also helped them to open up for other things that we did in our session. So, yeah. And we all, as I mentioned earlier, have thyroid problems. And mm -hmm. when you look at what's the emotional cause of hypothyroidism, this is what they cut right where your thyroid is, is right in your throat. And this is when you look at chakras, which are energy centers in the body, which is not woo woo. This is scientifically proven. It is <laughs> the chakra that is in our throat, right where the thyroid sits is our voice chakra. And so I believe that a lot of women have problems with thyroid because we're not speaking our truth. We are being overrun. We're doing way too much. We're trying to manage the household. Like I just talked to a woman the other day who's a full-time lawyer, a really good lawyer. So she's high up there. She's got kids. She's working from, you know, she's got her office and then she's coming home and she's doing the majority of the cleaning and the cooking. And I'm like, no wonder. And her cortisol was shot. And she, when I asked her, do you think you're stressed? She's like, no, not too much. Not too bad. <laughs> Um, maybe you are. And that was same with me so many years ago when I finally looked at when I couldn't lose the weight and I, I was looked at my hormones and my cortisol was shot and I would never have thought I was a stressed out person ever. But mm -hmm. thyroid is the things that you want to be saying and that you're not saying. And I mean, how many of us listening, all of you listening, you guys, can honestly say like, how many times do we not say what we want to be saying? You know, when we're struggling, when we're feeling under pressure, when we're raising our children, when we're feel like we're drowning, when we're in perimenopause and menopause, and we feel like we're losing it, we, we tend to not speak up about it. Okay. I got to tell, tell you something super real and raw. Yep. My mom was super emotionally abusive and her mode of um, abuse was yelling and screaming at all of us. And when I was 17, my older brother said, don't fight back. It'll be mm. over with sooner if you just shut up. Oh my gosh. Wow. I was, I was 17 years old and I am estranged from her now for my own mental health, but that went on for, I broke up with her when I was 42. So it went on for a long time. And I am certain that's the cause, <clears throat> underlying cause of my thyroid because it's stuck in, you know, all those years of not talk speaking up and then when she asked and we were in the middle of it I told her the issues and she said you shouldn't have told me oh my god wow wow oh, oh I god. I agree with that like all that stuckness mm -hmm. and I'm I'm doing some energy work because Co Karen is my coach and she <laughs> suggested I do some energy work so I'm working with a couple different energy people to try to release that because that's I've always had issues and I think that's why mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> since we're, since we're talking about that, I know, I mean, you know, Karen, I have a thyroid issue and I told you as well, Pam, and I'm still working with it. We're still trying to work it out. But, you know, I was, I was also um, abused as a, as a young child um, for many years. And so, um, and, you know, not a lot of people know that, but they do now. <laughs> <laughs> But it's real. It's real. And, and, and many women have experienced that. And, um, but I never told anyone for years, for years. And once I finally, you know, um, expressed that to my family, um, you know, it was, it was quite a shock. Um, and so I've had to do a lot of different things and uh, journaling has helped me tremendously 
in like uh, expressing my feelings, whereas they were bottled up for such a long time. Yep. And, and like certain things you just don't feel comfortable saying. Um, so uh, journaling has helped me a lot. Prayer has helped me tremendously. Um, you know, having that outlet and, and being able to, you know, express those feelings there in that, in that mode as well. Um, and, you know, just meditating on positive things, on Bible passages that's helped me to regain my, regain my strength. This is always still something you can work on. I, I think you'd probably agree, Pam, mm -hmm. Karen. Yeah. Um, but those things at least will help loosen things up within the body, you know, so that we can, we can, we can deal with them. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys for sharing that because women need to speak out more about these things, right? What's so sad is in the last few years, I think kind of on the tail end of the Me Too movement, I had just, you know, I'd gone on some girls trips with some of my old high school girlfriends and, and just, and talking to clients. And I, I started to hear, like, it was like all within this like six month time span of all of these women that had been raped or abused or something, you know, something really bad had happened to them when they were younger. And it got to the point where it was like every single friend I had had a story that I had no idea about. A friend of mine was like, oh yeah, when we used to live in such and such together, she said, one, remember so-and-so, it was one of our good friends that we hung out with all the time. We were 18 at the time. And she said, he, I woke up and he was raping me. And mm, I was like, cause wow. we were partying and drinking and, and I was like, what? Like, why, you know, 20 something years later, you're now telling us this, like, that is so sad. And so then, you know, and for me as well, I was um, raped by a friend, uh, my, my roommate's best friend um, in a party, same thing. I woke up from being passed out and to him having sex with me. I had been date raped a couple of times. Um, and all of that, do you think I said anything? Do you think I no, did anything? No, it was no. like, shut her down. And okay, I remember yeah. somebody doing body work on me once, Pam, and saying, um, when I would just start crying, they were doing some stuff around my mouth. And I remember the practitioner saying, because I've just started to just had this major emotional release with it and started to cry. And I remember him saying, these are all the things that you wanted to say and you never did. <laughs> Just maybe cry even harder, but yeah. it makes sense. Like when it you look at sense. that, it makes sense that we would have problems, like an energy, like shift in there where we're, we're blocking it. And I had another lady tell me, oh, you're just blocked from the waist down. She said, you've got no energy coming down into your pelvis. I'm like, of course I don't. I shut that down. And so we had to, I had to work on that. And it took many years of energy healing and talking to therapists and but I did the work and I still continue yeah. to do the work and I really think that that's a major missing piece for a lot of people is looking at emotional root causes of things that are getting in their way from being the best that they can be in this in this day and age I agree a million percent and that's why I believe so many women turn to food for comfort because they don't want to talk about their yes. experience or their pain. Yes. And it's so much easier to comfort eat your feelings. But the problem is the feelings are still there. You put the food goes on top, but we all know that does not go away until you deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Stress yeah. is stress and emotions are the biggest cause of sugar addiction and mm -hmm. food addiction. And people just continue to look for the quick fix for the diet that's going to fix that emotional problem and that food addiction. And it's like, mm -hmm, you got to start digging way deeper <laughs> to get yeah. to the bottom. No diet is going to fix that. Yeah. You can't. And, and like you said earlier, and like you said earlier, I mean, we got to do the work. Yeah. It's, it's not a pill. It's not a shake. It's not a drink. It's not, we have to put in the effort to, you know, uncover some of those things because those are going to continue to come up in our lives. They're going to resurface and create roadblocks to where we want to be. And so in yeah. order to, to remove those roadblocks, we got to face it. Yeah. And I do think things like if you ignore that, if you ignore these things that need to be dealt with, then it's like the universe just keeps throwing stuff at you. It's like, oh, really? You're not going to pay attention? Take this. <laughs> Let's see if you're going to pay attention now. Right. And like, 
crappier and crappier things start to happen sometimes because we're not addressing it. And I, I swear the universe, God, whomever is going, I'm going to make sure you learn this lesson. And so if I have to keep causing harsher and harsher things to happen to you, I'm going to, until you wake up and go, Oh, maybe this is me. Right? <laughs> maybe I need to deal with something. <laughs> It's kind of the same, even with our own bodies as, you know, if we try to ignore or uh, wish away perimenopause and menopause, it's not going anywhere. We're going to continue to age, but we keep ignoring that body and the body's like, you know, at first this tap on the shoulder and it's kind of gentle. It's like, Hey, you know, I need your attention. I need, I need you to do something here. So things are happening. And we're like, ah, no, I'm not in menopause or no, I'm okay. I'm eating well. And, and it's not until the body like gets your attention in ways that you don't like, then it's like, oh, oh, I, oh, were you saying something to me? Oh, I need to do something? Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and something else that I want to bring up too with you guys is, so this is something that we talked about before we actually started to record today. And it wasn't, we weren't planning on talking about this, but I think it's really important, kind of goes along with what we were just talking about, which is the connotation that we of older women, the, the word older women and how, what we, what, what that uh, stereotype is right now, when we women hear the word, I'm an older woman, or if we say, oh, we're older women, some people get very offended by that. I've had somebody say to me, I'm not an older woman. Don't call me that kind of thing. And I'm like, but you're 60, <laughs> what, what would you call yourself then? <laughs> and maybe it's like 60 years young. I do like to say things like that, yeah. but we, we get upset about it. We don't like hearing that we're aging or that we're older women because of what we relate that to, which is older women are not valued as much. We're, we're being told by society that we should look a certain way. We shouldn't gain weight. We shouldn't have wrinkles. We shouldn't have gray hair. Like God forbid we age. And so women are going through, going to extreme lengths to try, try and stay looking young because growing older has such a negative energy around it. And that's really sad because you guys are like, you guys are both almost 55. You look absolutely gorgeous. And to me, I'm like, oh my God, being an older woman is amazing. I personally love it. Like, yes, of course, I don't like the extra weight around my midline. I don't like, you know, so, you know, lots of wrinkles or anything. It's like, but whatever, I'm, I'm embracing it. It's like, it's all part of aging. I'm okay with it. I'm dying my hair gray for heaven's sakes. I'm obviously trying to look older than I am. <laughs> no, but the young girls are, are dying their hair that They color. are. So there you go. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> yes, yes. It's interesting you should say that because it, it, we are in a society that really worships youth. Yep. But there, there, is a, there is a balance to that because with age comes the wisdom and experience that you all, that, that you all have that we share. And we can avoid some of the pitfalls that we experienced maybe when we were younger. Um, and don't count us out, right, Pam? I mean, look at you. You're amazing. And, and the, if, you, if, you, if anybody that's watching this or listening to this, if they see Pam's workouts, your jaw is going to drop. <laughs> oh, seriously. Her, seriously. Her like little bra top and her spandex little pants. Just as I'm cute like, as she could be. Oh. Yes. Look at How her in the world. Yes. <laughs> pull-ups, right, Pam? Pull-ups. She goes, you. Karen, pull you gotta yes. do pull-ups. Cause she, I'm like, how do you get those gorgeous arms? And she's like, do some pull-ups. <laughs> <laughs> pull-ups and never giving up on yourself or your health. I think when we're younger, we're in more of a hurry, right? And I'm like, you know what? Things are gonna take time, but if you keep on and don't stop, you know, I've told you both, the first pull-up took me six months to get to one. <laughs> Six, but I'm a Taurus. I am not giving up. I am stubborn <laughs> and I am just never giving up. And I'm like, you know what? I will do this for as long as I can. I have a pull up bar in my backyard. It is worth the effort to do. And I think what we're talking about food, fitness, weight loss, being at a healthy weight, staying regular with your exercise, that is the key to longevity and the fountain of youth. 
very few older people that I see in my gym that are working out, they don't look their age, they don't act their age, their gait is un, a lot different because they're in shape. A person's gait has a lot to say about how fit they are in their body. I'm not saying like you have to be extreme fit, but I'm saying when you take the time to do a lot of walking, do your strength training, eat well, it definitely shows. And so I, I feel like right now in our 50, in the, it being in my 50s, it's the best time of my life. My kids are out of the house right now. I have time to put into my clients. I have time to travel if I want to travel. And I know what I can do to take the best care of myself as possible. So for, I don't like being called ma'am. That, that kind of bugs me at the grocery store, like the baggers, if they say ma'am. But I'll take older woman or middle-aged woman because mm -hmm. I'm hoping to get to 100. So this would actually be the middle of my life or maybe 90s, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, but, but so many women are offended. And I wonder what goes deeper than that. Why are they offended? Mm -hmm. Is it because when their mom was their age, they acted and looked a lot different? So they think 60, my, my mom was 60. She could barely get up off of the chair. I don't know what the, that particular lady was thinking, but I'm, I'm going to be double nickel and I'm freaking proud of it. Double nickel. Yes. I like that. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to use that, Pam. <laughs> well, I've almost finished my menstruation. Like it's getting pretty crazy now. And I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. this is the final hurrah that's happening. I can tell, you yeah. know, it's getting lighter and lighter and it's irregular. And I've been like a 28 day person my whole life. And I am just like <laughs> embracing it. I'm like, bring it on. No more yes. period. Awesome. <laughs> gray hair, bring it on. I don't have to diet anymore. Gray. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think becoming a wise woman is amazing. This is the best is. mentally I've ever been in my entire life. Yep. I most feel confident. Great. Yeah, most confident. I, think, I would actually yeah. say I'm almost the, in the best shape of my life now as well. Like I've, mm -hmm. thanks to Pam, <laughs> <laughs> I do. I feel so strong and I haven't lost weight, but I've put on so much muscle that I'm actually starting to like go, Oh, look at me. Like I was telling my husband, the other day, I've got my underwear and I'm, I'm like, look, look at the side profile. Look at my bum. There's just a, just, can you just see that? it's just a smidge of a bump there. It's not completely flat anymore. He's like, Oh, definitely. I'm sure he was lying, but <laughs> he was like, Oh no, yeah. The truth. <laughs> yeah. But I was like so excited because I always have had such a pancake butt and I'm like, they look at, look, there's a little curve there. I think, yeah, I think it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> your body composition changes when you lose weight. Yeah. So you're adding muscle. Now your fat people are in the wrong assumption that your fat cells go away. They don't go away. They just shrink. Right. Mm -hmm. So they it's, shrink. I have a woman in my group who she is 20 pounds away from her goal, but she's fitting in her smallest size pants that she has because she's added strength training in. So, you know, awful, awful old wives tale of it. You're going to be huge. when you strength train? You actually shrink because your body composition, you know, changes in your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think people, women need to know that you can't get super big as like, you can't have that look that right. you see some women that are like bodybuilder look, unless you're taking steroids, like even the women that are jacked up those CrossFit women that I just, I love how they look. They got the big thunder thighs and the big butt <laughs> they're doing some something. Let me tell you, it's not yeah. natural for women to look like that. They're, you're going to have the odd person that's just super genetically superior that looks like that naturally without taking any enhancers. But in most cases, and I've, and I know this because I've asked them, I've mm -hmm. asked bodybuilders, I've said like, tell me the truth. Are you looking like that naturally? Or are you taking something? And they're like, oh, pff, taking something and everybody else that looks like that is taking something. Mm -hmm. So women can bodybuild like crazy. Like I've been lifting super heavy now since the summertime. Do I, yes, I may have a bit of a curve in my bum, but do I look like a, you know, I'm all jacked up? No. no. Well, I can tell from doing Pam's workouts that uh, when my husband and I go bike riding, I'm going up hills much easier. I am able to lift um, heavier weights with my arms. Um, so I'm really, really um, excited and happy about that. It just, it just gives you a level of confidence that, um, you know, you might not have experienced before. And, and I love your workouts, Pam, personally, and I recommend them to all of my clients. Yeah, same. 
<laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah, so you guys can check out Pam's YouTube channel. She's got lots of free workouts on there that are mm-hmm. amazing. And she's yeah. very easy to listen to, which is nice as well, right? Mm-hmm. I love and I love to- also the balance because oh, yeah. we lose balance as we get older. Uh yeah. I didn't lose balance as I got older. I I didn't have any balance when I was younger either. (laughs) So that's always been a problem. So I love how you incorporate in all of your workouts, you incorporate balance training too. And and that getting up from off of the floor, I never really would have thought that how important that is until I started doing it. It's like, yeah, I need to know how to do that. Yeah. Which sounds so ridiculous when you hear it, right? Like, like, what do you mean? Get off, you (laughs) can't get off the floor. But Yeah. (laughs) It's a big thing. My, my thing that I noticed, which was interesting, Ben, I told my husband this too. I'm like, I can bend down to the dryer and get the clothes out in a squat position without being in pain anymore. I used to do that. My knees would hurt. I'd be like, and I'd be wobbly. Now I'm like, bring it on. I can squat here all day, taking this laundry out. So just like little things going upstairs, walking, my knees were always in pain. They're never in pain anymore. Mm-hmm. So I in love- addition to fitness, what about hormones that that also some people find that, you know, it helps them to feel youthful care. What can you tell us about that? Well, everybody knows I <laughs> love the hormones and we're going to get into the hormones in our Q and a, but I really think like diet wise, getting that protein in, and I know you yep. guys agree with it. Anti-inflammatory diets work amazing for hormones And bodybuilding is your number one, should be your number one choice of fitness, even though I am a believer, like do something that you like to do. Yeah. Right. Like if you Mm -hmm. want to go to Zumba class or dance class, because that's, it gets you happy or yoga. That's great. If possible though, you should really try to be weightlifting a couple of times a week because there's just nothing like it for what it's going to do to your metabolism, your body, your insulin sensitivity for your hormones. Like the list goes on and on. So Besides that, then come in the hormones. And this is where like, cause calorie counting won't work. You could go down to 500 calories a day, but if you lost your hormones, guess what? You're not going to lose any weight or very minimal. So we all know we've got to get the hormones in check as you age. So if you're in your thirties, then you can do a lot without taking hormones. And you can do so many with supplements and food that will help to rebalance your hormones. You can take away away stuff out of your home, your your environment can be cleaned up. And all of that makes a huge impact on your hormonal system in your 30s, 20s and 30s. Once you get into your 40s, 50s and beyond, the only way that you're going to get that hormonal impact anymore on your health, the positive hormonal impact is if you replace the hormones. Unfortunately, there is nothing natural that you can take that's going to bring back your ovarian function as you age. And all the research shows that women that replace their hormones are healthier than the ones that don't replace their hormones. And there is so much evidence coming out right now about how it can actually help that you not to get breast cancer, reduce your risk of getting breast cancer. Most women immediately think, oh, if I take estrogen therapy, I'm going to get breast cancer. Yeah. Not true. If that was true, every young woman would have would be riddled with breast cancer because we have a ton of estrogen in our teens and in our 20s. So all I find of these it interesting. Things. Oh, and I mean to cut you off, Karen. Oh, I find it so interesting that um, the resistance that we find when it comes to mentioning bioidentical hormone uh, replacement is the same people who say, "Well, I don't want to get breast cancer, or I'm afraid of hormones, or I don't, you know, I, I don't want to take any any hormones into my body." Many of them have taken birth control pills for many years. The most toxic form of of hormones, right? Yeah, myself included. Before I knew better. Um, too. Yeah. Right. And so it, I find it interesting. It's just, it really needs to be, people really need to be educated and understand the, the, the tremendous benefits of, of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. Yeah, I totally agree. That's why I think you're such an amazing menopause coach, Dana. <laughs> We're teaching women things yeah. that they don't know, right? We just had somebody in our group there the other day that said, 
I'm something about bioidentical hormones. Remember that? And she was like, yes, but I, you know, I'm worried about estrogen because I don't want to get breast cancer. <sighs> it was like, Oh geez. And this is what every woman thinks, right? Mm-hmm. If they, before they listen to what I have to say, yes. <laughs> what Dana has to say, <laughs> Pam's on hormones. Dana's on hormones. I'm on hormones. Can't live without them. Hey ladies. Can't live without them. Never. Would not want to, would not no. want to. I sleep better. My sex drive is better. My mood is better. I was just telling my sister yesterday, cause she was telling me how bad her PMS was. And I was like, you know what? I have zero PMS or very little. I would say 5% of what I used to have. And it's amazing. I hardly know when my period's coming anymore. And I'm like, this is due to the hormones. I'm taking great supplements for hormones as well. I've prepared my body for the hormones. My body loves the hormones and it's just stabilizes everything and improves everything. Like I think I've been hormone deficient for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And speaking of um, hormones, don't we have this, my favorite hormone detox that's coming up? Yes. (laughs) It's like my absolute favorite. I get so excited about it. (laughs) I know you're like, I'm going to do this like four times a year. I'm like, go for it. So it's a liver gallbladder detox that I host every January inside my group. It's for four weeks and liver detoxification is just so powerful. There's some people, they're like health practitioners that are like, oh, they kind of puffaw the whole, you know, liver detox. And they're like, oh, you know, you can do the two week liver detox. That's ridiculous. And your body will clean itself out. And it's like, uh, no. We are so inundated by toxins right now, everywhere. Nobody is, is free of them. I've, the last I read is something like we have like 500 different chemicals in our body at one time now. You can't escape it. So to do liver detoxification is so important for your liver health, but your hormone health, your body processes a lot of the hormones through your liver. Your body has to in order to lose weight has to have a good liver. So liver, liver, gallbladder, super, super important. I think detoxification and everybody can do it, you know, from home, get a good liver detoxification that addresses phase one and phase two detoxification. I'm so excited. That's my I know. Time. Yes. Pam's in it. Oh, Pam, you're going to absolutely love it. You're going to feel amazing. In fact, I've started to incorporate like once a month, to do some of those, um, the soups and the juices and things that are on that liver detox and the meals um, on the liver detox, just to kind of like give myself a boost. Great. Yeah. Awesome. I try to quite often incorporate things that I know are good for the liver, like I beets and carrots and ginger and all of those food, the cruciferous vegetables. I daily, I eat something that is going to help my liver for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, not drinking that always helps too, (laughs) but we won't go there today. Okay. So we've asked, all of us asked our listeners, followers for questions and what questions do they have going into the new year when it comes to their hormones, their weight, their diet, their fitness. And we got a good turnout of questions, didn't we? Actually, I have to pull up. I actually have more than here than what I have here right now. So let's start with, um, Pam, what is the best exercise regimen to follow as you enter the menopause phase of life while starting hormone therapy and trying to lose weight at the same time? My diet is under control for the most part. This is from Suzanne. Suzanne, strength train three times a week. And if you don't know what to do, hire a trainer because it can be very intimidating to go to a gym by yourself. Don't Uh, I would avoid the weightlifting machines as most of those are actually made for men. And we are, you know, six inches to a foot shorter than men and our bodies do not fit on them. I would recommend free weights always. If you're looking for body weight workouts, check out my YouTube channel, The Perfect Balance. I have tons of body weight workouts for you. And like Karen said, I said the exact same thing to my clients, find movement you love. If you love yoga, go to yoga. If you love Pilates, do Pilates. But Friends, ladies, Pilates is not enough. You need heavy resistance training. Now you will not start there, but you will get there eventually. Something you're going to do forever because our bodies are supposed to move until the day we die. So you can Zumba your little, your little beautiful bum off until the day you die. You can yoga, you can belly dance. YouTube is a great source for any exercise you want to do. I've done 
old school Billy Blanks, Ty Bo, um, so many things, but strength training at least three times a week, four times would be great. Uh, and stretching would be great as well. And diet under control. Are you focusing on protein and fiber? Uh, I don't know what in control actually means, but if you mm -hmm. don't get at least 25 grams of protein per, per meal, please shoot for that. Mm -hmm. And I will say too, as you go into perimenopause and menopause, if you are wanting to take bioidentical hormones or you are on bioidentical hormones, fitness is so important. I mean, it's always important, but when it comes to the hormone piece of things, when you put your hormones on, you want to be moving your body. So those hormones can circulate inside mm -hmm. your system. It's very important. Yeah. And then of course, sweating. And then like you said, eating that fiber to help break down the hormones that you're taking on because you don't want to recirculate them all very important, but yeah, exercise, 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 putting muscle on will help you to raise your testosterone levels. It'll help you become insulin sensitive, which is so important because as women age, we become more yeah. insulin resistant because of the loss of hormones in our system. So making sure that you're lifting weights for those, for that purpose as well, um, as you age is really important. Mm -hmm. It also helps our bones. It, it helps protect the bones. It protects, right. it, it adds to the bone density. Bones are, are dynamic. And so they break down and they build up. And so when we um, engage in weight bearing exercise, resistance training, you know, it helps to put the right amount of pressure, the right amount of stress on those bones to help build them up and make them strong. So nobody wants to fall at our age. It's certainly much different falling at five or six than falling at 50 or 60. But if we do, it's, it won't, we won't really injure ourselves. And um, also having bone strength, like Pam mentioned, is gonna give us balance um, and it's gonna make our, our muscles stronger. So all the way around, and, and including like you said, uh, Karen, testosterone. You know, that's a natural way for women to, to increase testosterone levels. So, I mean, all the way around weight training, weight bearing, resistance exercise, that is the key. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question here that was uh, sent in, which I didn't have on our little sheet ladies, but I'm going to say, I forgot to write this one down, but this is a good one. Um, she wants to stay anonymous. So I'll just tell her initials or, or her initials are BS. <laughs> this is no BS, but okay. What is the difference between hormone replacement, bioidentical estrogen cream compounded by a pharmacy versus getting them via a doctor prescription for estrogel filled at a regular pharmacy. She's in Canada. So I will answer this one because this is, it, it, I was just had a client in New Zealand yesterday mm -hmm. and they don't have compounding pharmacies in New Zealand. Really? And oh my, do they talk badly about it? Like I found these websites that were like, just trashed compounding pharmacies. And I was like, that's brutal. Oh, wow. And you guys do not have your information correct. I actually have a compounding pharmacist coming on the podcast um, later this month. So, oh, great. And I'm going to get into all of that with him. So anyways, the difference is when you get, so there's two different things that you can get, you know, you can get over the counter in the United States or you can get a prescription from your doctor that is from a pharmaceutical company. So the hormone you're going to use is being made by a pharmaceutical company. Those ones come in specific doses. You can't change the dose. So they have things like estrogel. Estrogel is going to give you 0.75 milligrams per pump, if I remember correctly. Could be 0 0.6. <laughs> They have estrogen patches, which come usually in 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and um, 100 point. Yeah, you got that one, Pam? 0 0.1, and I do the 0 0.1 and the 0.5. Yes, perfect. I do 0 0.5 and estrogel together because I find I need to keep my levels topped up a little bit. There's also um, suppositories. There's what's called an E-string, which can be up into the vagina and just releases a bit of estrogen right into the vagina tissue. So it can help with atrophy of the vagina and dry vagina tissue, which is amazing. My clients love, love, love that, that have that, that have had that problem with aging, mm -hmm. which is very common. Your vagina dries up yes. and it's like shuts down. 
very common. Mine definitely was heading down that direction. Now I've got no problem. So we won't get into the details of my vagina today, but I'm sure you guys are all like, come on, tell us more, Karen. <laughs> and then there's compounding, um, compounding pharmacies. Now compounding pharmacies, you still need a prescription from your doctor, but your doctor will tailor that prescription to your needs. So most doctors are going to go with the prescriptions from pharmaceutical companies because it's easy. It's what they know. Most of them aren't trained in bioidentical hormones at all. So they don't tend to go down the road of compounded. But if you go see, you know, go to a hormone clinic, if you go to a naturopath here in Canada, um, down there, if you go see a functional doctor or somebody that specializes in hormone therapy, or you are specific and ask your doctor for something very specific, then you can get compounded, which is that practitioner can say, you know what, I think based on your lab work, you need actually four milligrams a day of estrogen, two milligrams in the morning, two milligrams at night. So instead of using like all these pumps of gel and slapping on 50 patches and right, you can tailor it to what you need. And so when you go in a higher, higher dosage, then you have to get, then it's better to get compounded. And I think most women should end up probably being compounded um, because we tend to need more than what the pharmaceutical company dosages are. So instead of buying, you'd have to buy too much, have to put on too many patches. It's better than just to go and get compounded. Unfortunately, I know here in Canada, compounded tends to cost more because it's not that it costs more, sorry. It doesn't tend to be covered by our extended medical. So we get a lot of stuff paid for here, right? So it's, it's not, it's not more expensive. It's just, it, if you get a pharmaceutical one, it tends to like mine are all free, which is why I've done that route for now, because it's completely covered. So I get hormones for free. You guys, on the other hand, some of you have medical, some of you don't, some of you gets covered, some of it doesn't. I've had some women tell me that compounded is cheaper than pharmaceuticals down in the United States. So I think it's quite different down there. Yeah, I have a compounded uh, testosterone cream that uh, uh, it's actually in olive oil because the cream had some ingredients that I wasn't too crazy about. So I was like, you know what, can you put it in olive oil? And they could. So wow. um, I absolutely love it. Love it, love it. Um, but I do use the creams, the um, uh, est estradiol and estriol cream combination uh, for now. Um, I do want to move over to the patch, uh, but the testosterone in the olive oil, the compounded, it works great. Um, so that leads me to a question about um, compounded uh, uh, hormones. So um, can you co compound like a testosterone and estrogen together? Is it, is it, or do you have to have them separate? What's your thoughts on that? What I usually tell my clients is they should start with having it separated because you're not going to know what's doing what. And if you have to change the dose of something, then you're going to have to change both of them at the same time. And you may not need to. And so when you're for, for the first three months, I say, have everything done separately. So have your estrogen cream or patch, have, have your testosterone cream, have your progesterone pills or cream. And, and take them all separately so that you can and go, okay, here's what, you know, I, I'm still having hot flashes. Okay. Then increase your estrogen. Oh, I'm still have, I still have really low libido and I'm not putting on muscle. Okay. Double your testosterone, you know, so you can make, do that. You can make those alterations. And then once you kind of get to a dosage that you're like, okay, I'm going to stay here for a while. This is good. Then you can say to your pharmacist, put the testosterone and estrogen together. Now, testosterone and estrogen are typically taken every day. So that mm -hmm. can work to put those two together. Progesterone, on the other hand, a lot of doctors I see, they'll put the progesterone in with estrogen. And I don't like that. They will compete for the receptors, the hormone receptors. That's not good. You want your estrogen and you want your progesterone separate. Progesterone should be taken two to three weeks out of the month. If you're a cycling woman, it should just be for two weeks out of the month. The last two weeks is when we naturally form, um, produce progesterone. If you're in menopause and, you're do, and you really like your progesterone days, you can do three weeks on one week off, but you always need to have that break 
because we need the estrogen to make by itself to make progesterone receptors. If you have too much progesterone, it will downregulate the production of estrogen, which then means that you won't get your progesterone. So it's all tied in together, right? So Mm -hmm. at first separate, and then you can start putting them some, at least the estrogen testosterone together after that. That makes sense. That's a, that was a great answer. Thank you. Yes. (laughs) All right. Where are we here? Um, Oh yes. Uh, Well, I'm going to ask you this question, Dana, do hormones such as estrogen patch and oral progesterone need to be taken forever? I'm 51 and postmenopausal. I love that question. Um, why would you not? <laughs> yes. Hello. <laughs> why would you not? <laughs> I know women in their 70s that are safely taking uh, bioidentical hormone replacement and feel amazing. So um, it's it's if if it's not occurring in your body currently naturally and you do have to replace it and you feel good, why would you want to stop? <laughs> why would you want to take that away from yourself? Yeah. It, it would, it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, some women think they just don't want to, they don't want to take them forever. And then they, so they try and stop and they don't feel good. Yeah, and they're they like, good. like my mom who's 67, she's like, I can't live with, like, she'll still get my mom at 67 will still get hot flashes if she doesn't take her progesterone. Yeah. Crazy. At 67, I think I'm, and I'm just following in her footsteps, like no tomorrow. So (laughs) my other sister, no, (laughs) but yeah, me, I'm taking after my mom. She went into menopause early too, and had a rough time with it. And I am like the worst hot flasher. Like I hot flash constantly if I don't use hormones. Yeah. I have a client that's um, in her sixties and she's still experiencing um, the hot flashes. So it's like, yeah just go ahead and take them. (laughs) Yeah. Now research shows most of the research that's been done on long-term hormone replacement therapy has been done on women taking oral old HRT. Old HRT is Primarin, which is from pregnant horses and progestins, which is fake progesterone, which is the most toxic and the one that leads to breast cancer and uterine cancer. So most studies have been, long-term studies have been on those two. And it shows that after 10 years post-menopause, the research gets a little murky. And and there is evidence that shows in some women that there is a very small increase in their risk of breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke after that 10-year window. So a lot of practitioners, hormone doctors will say like, we have this 10 year window where it's been, where it's been shown to be the most beneficial, but there was a research that some research that just came out of Arizona, which I've talked about several times, I think on this podcast, but I just think it's so exciting because I have the Alzheimer's gene, (laughs) which is women that take estrogen for six years or longer show a 75% decrease in developing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. That's huge. That's huge. Huge. So why would we want to start atrophying our brain? I'm not too sure why. (laughs) And I think if we're using topical, bioidentical, that it's definitely safer to take it long-term. And I've, like you, Dana, I have women that are older that are on it, that have started it older even because they, like my mom started estrogen this year at 67, because I told her to. (laughs) she was having troubles with her brain and her dad died Mm -hmm. of Alzheimer's. So she's got the Alzheimer's gene. I've got the Alzheimer's gene. Her and I, guess what? We need to be on estrogen until the day we die. Yeah. I really believe that. That's huge. That's huge for, for a disease that says there's no cure. Right. My dad died of it. Really? So do you have the gene? I no. I got the blood test and my doctor's (gasps) like, do you want to know? And I'm like, do I want to know? And she said, do you want to know? And I'm like, okay. (laughs) Well, my mom said, oh, I don't want to know because then I'll think I'm always going to get it. And I'm like, mom, you need to know because then you can do so much to prevent it, Mm -hmm. including taking estrogen. Yes. And just do a liver and and gallbladder detox. (laughs) Exactly. Every few months to, you know, to uh, help get rid of the recirculating estrogens. Yeah. And the toxins. Mm -hmm. right? Which affects your brain. So your brain. Yeah. All right. 
Next, ladies. Dana, which comes first, heal the gut or balance the hormones? That's a good one. That is a good one. That is a good one. Um, do them all at the same time. I agree. Because um, once you, if you, you can't really separate it because they all have an effect on, mm -hmm. on each other, right? Because our gut produces uh, a lot of our hormones. 70% of serotonin mm -hmm. is produced in the gut. So we have to, to, we have to do them both. And I found that in working with my clients to um, clean up their diet, you know, repopulate the gut with, you know, um, uh, good bacteria, the uh, prebiotic fiber, get rid of the sugar, the alcohol. I know we're going to talk about alcohol another time, but <laughs> those things are, are, are going to help. And, and you can attack all of those problems all at once. And then once you get to, once you get to a point where you're starting to feel better, then you can hone on in on other things and see, you know, well, what do I still need to tweak a little bit more so that I'm feeling optimal? So yeah, we got, we have to work on all of that all together. You can't really separate it because they're very much intertwined. Yeah. I just read something too, two days ago from Dr. Lindsay Berkson. She sent out a great report that she wrote about estrogen and bioidentical hormones. And she had put in there the, the studies that have been done on how estrogen and progesterone both can help get rid of leaky gut syndrome. So when you're wow. older and you're losing those hormones, a lot of women will say like my digestive system is off mm -hmm. and replacing the hormones can actually help with digestion, which I think Look is amazing. Mm -hmm. Hormones for the win again. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so Pam, I've got a question for you. Yes. So um, what do you do um, when you take recommendations from a naturopath or um, taking recommended supplements, oh, eating yeah. clean, exercise, um, and they still do all of the things that the naturopath recommends and they still can't lose weight. What I, ju I just had a client like this um, and she told me what her naturopath said. And I just said, you're eating too much fat. Oh, She was not in a calorie deficit and was having handfuls of nuts for snacks. That can be an extra five, six, seven hundred calories a day. And I said the quality of what you're eating is amazing. No sugar, no alcohol, no white, white bread, sugar, any of that. But I said, you gotta stop snacking on nuts because your body, in in my experience, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nutritionist. In my experience, though, women do not see the scale move unless they're in a deficit and too much fat. Well, I mean, come on now. They're delicious and yummy. We all love our nuts, but sprinkle them on your salad. Do not have them as a snack because who takes 12 almonds? I mean, come on now. Nobody does. That's just you? unrealistic. Well, you have come a long way and you know now, but for most people, I would say if they, if you are working with somebody, you're not losing weight, you're eating too many calories. So I would go back to what Karen said. What I had her do is log on my fitness pal. She might be eating 2000 calories. I do not know one woman that can eat 2000 calories and lose weight. So what I tell people, and this is not glamorous, not exciting. If you were eating 2000 calories, Go down to 1900 next week. Stay there. If you're not losing weight, go down to 1800. Don't automatically go to 1200 because you're going to binge. Mm. Little tiny increments of decreasing to get to the deficit and then seeing the scale move is really the way to go. Yeah. I love that approach, Pam, because women are extremists. And so if they're eating 2000, oh, I, I need to go down to 1000 or, you know, like you said, 1200 yeah. and, and they do it too much and too fast and, and it doesn't work that way. And I can love we talk a balanced approach? Thank you. And we talk about my fitness pal, it's liar, liar, pants on fire, because Karen, <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times if you do this, you will lose 10 pounds in a month. It's so well, annoying. If only it, it was that so easy. <laughs> it's so annoying. And, and here's what I have to say is they have to cover their behind by telling you to eat more calories. For the most part, it's going to give you too many calories to eat. So what I tell, and I told Karen this, when you log, do not hit finish your day because it will tell you, you are under calories. And you're like, yeah. oh, I get to eat more. Yeah. <laughs> nope. Don't, don't finish the day. It's okay not to come be that bad, be that, break the rules, right, Dana? Break yes, the rules. Yes, break the rules. <laughs> Don't finish the day and then just go to the next day, but really slow increments. I mean, even if you were eating 2,000, you went to 1,800, that's fine, but don't go to 15. That's going to be too extreme. 
I've seen it. I've done it myself. It leads to binging every time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then of course, check your hormones. Come on. (laughs) She never mentioned that she was doing anything for her hormones. So I say, (laughs) check your hormones. And I know this woman, she's, she is in menopause. And so hormones, 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 but I do I agree with Pam on that, on the calorie counting. It, it, uh, and, and it's been proven to me. So <laughs> 300 <laughs> calories of whipping cream. Okay. We got two more here. Um, okay. No, did that one. Uh, when, to, when do we know, how do you assess when to start bioidentical estrogen? This is from Mary. So I'm a believer that you start taking estrogen when you start getting the symptoms of low estrogen, and then you prove that with hormone testing, you don't have to be in menopause to start estrogen therapy. I think most women think that, or they think like, why, why take it? And you know, why we'll just wait until I absolutely have to No, Cause I'll tell you what in perimenopause, when your estrogen starts to go, that is when you see the weight gain almost across the board. The weight gain happens before you get to menopause most of the time. Mm-hmm. Some women still continue gaining in menopause, but the majority of the weight gain happens in perimenopause. And then it can continue for about a year to two years once you get into menopause and then it seems to plateau. So I say, why are we waiting till we're insulin resistant, leptin resistant, 20 pounds overweight, brittle bones, sagging boobs. Uh, <laughs> hello, estrogen's really, really good for your face um, wrinkles. Yes. It has, it helps you, your body to produce collagen. So it's important for hair. Women will start losing their hair when they start losing their estrogen. Their thyroid starts to go down. Their thyroid function will go down because you need progesterone and estrogen. So I typically see women starting progesterone early in their forties, usually. And estrogen is ideally started when you start losing the estrogen. So you take a test, um, look at your follicular stimulating hormone. If that's going up over 10, that's a sign that you need some, that you can start replacing your estrogen um, and work with a practitioner, obviously. And then same with when you're older, you can start, you can start your hormones anytime. You just, the longer you've been in menopause, the slower you have to take it as far as dosage goes, this, you know, you start at a very small dose because you have to wake the receptors back up again and mm-hmm. you have to go low and slow for a period of time bef- before you start putting more in, but you mm-hmm. can start at them at any age. Nice. That's good to know. I remember when I, in, in perimenopause, just to emphasize your point, I was working, I had started gaining weight and I started working out with a trainer and was doing all the things. I was following the whole 30 at the time. I was losing weight. And then suddenly something, a, a trigger like went on in my body. It's like, nope, we don't want to lose any more weight. Yeah. And I was working out, working my tail off. And at the end of the sessions, I don't think, I think I worked with her for a couple months. I was heavier at the end of my, yes, Pam. Yes. I was heavier at oh, the end God. of my session than when I started. Wow. I cried. Yeah, I was crying <laughs> But had too. I known that it was because I was losing my estrogen and how, how responsible it is for insulin uh, sensitivity and, and, um, you know, metabolic function, I would have done something earlier. So hopefully, you know, what we're talking about today can help people that are like right in that age group, you know, to, to be more comfortable and to understand what's going on with their bodies. Mm -hmm. So I have another question. I had one of my followers asked about flowering plant uh, Mm. essential oils and if they have the same benefits as uh, the bioidentical hormone replacement, like uh, cardio protection, breast protection, bone protection, you know, things like that brain. So do they work the same? And, um, you know, do they have the same benefits? I have changed my stance on essential oils. I love essential oils for diffusing them, using them in cleaning products, like as a cleaning product, I, everything I have is essentially oil scented. However, it is extremely hard on your liver and your body when you take them internally. 
So I say no to taking anything that's an essential oil on the inside of your body. On the outside, using drops on the on your feet, on your on, like I use one that's yeah. for my digestive system, on my stomach, on the outside of my stomach. Great. I think that they work really well. I've seen women that are in their reproductive years use uh, Vitex essential oil and it really raises their progesterone levels. Works really well for that. So when it comes to that, it works. I think they do have a place. They can mildly help with stuff. Once though you're in menopause, there, you can take essential oils like, you know, peppermint around your skin to help cool down from a hot flash. Is it going to get rid of the hot flashes? Is it going to help bring your hormones back and get that ovarian function going? Absolutely not. Yeah. So great for fertile women to help balance their hormones out, mm -hmm. be, be very careful with them. They're very powerful and do not take them internally. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you for answering that. <laughs> And one more, we had one from a doctor, Dr. Dana, actually, Dr. Dana Shafir. She said, this was on my Instagram. She said, how do you feel about testosterone replacement during peri and post menopause when, oh, free, free levels of testosterone when it's non-existent? Um, less natural ways to help boost testosterone before replacement. So if it's low testosterone, when you're in your fertile years, there's definitely some amazing things that you can take for it. Maca being my top choice, um, zinc, horny goat weed, DHEA, which is a hormone. Uh, what else? Uh, what else do I use for testosterone? Oh, um, Tongat. Tongat is a really good one. Mm -hmm. So there's different, and there's heard of that one. Tonga. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's really good actually for it. Maca though is probably my favorite for women that can help increase DHEA and testosterone. Mm -hmm. But as you age, if you're in menopause and you've got no testosterone, then once again, like, yes, testosterone can be made out of the adrenal system. It's primarily made from the ovaries. So when your ovaries shut down, they just shut down. There's no more making it. So then I say you should probably replace the testosterone. Um, a lot of women that don't lose weight when they replace their estrogen in menopause, when they start to replace the testosterone, they'll lose the weight because of course you get muscle from that, right? So if you're working out and you're not putting that muscle on because you've got no testosterone, then this can really help um, with that. And then it'll in turn help with weight loss. So I do think that testosterone should be replaced if you don't have any when you're in menopause, because I think it's extremely important. Um, supporting the adrenal system, of course, is very key as well to not losing your testosterone as you age. It's funny because I see about half and half, like half women will lose their testosterone in menopause and then other women, they keep it and their levels are great. So once again, test, test, test and, and find out, replace if you're older, if you're younger, try supplementation first. Ladies, that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have to have another round table with you guys, I think. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> even if we just like the QA part of it was so great. So even if we did another QA, if there's lots of interest in it, then we'll we can do that again. But this has been amazing. I want to thank you both for coming on the show and being part of my first round table talk on the other side of weight loss. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.